welcome to the Rapid7 Metasploit demo meeting for uh, uh, May 2nd. Um, we've got a lot of really cool stuff to show you. I've got some new innovative charts to show you as well about some things that we're doing um, you know, overall as part of the community. And uh, so I'm excited to show you everything. Uh, let's go and get started. All right, so the first thing we'll be talking about here is Metasploit Framework and all the related projects that are involved in that. Um, first thing I'd like to show is a Metasploit PR trends this is something we've been doing for a little while and just be, to keep trying to keep track of like what's our engagement are we keeping up with the input and the output um uh to kind of give you an idea here um generally we get four or five pull requests every single time better than others um uh, so some days we get eight, nine, ten, and some days we, don't we only get a couple but, but um but on average we're getting about 30 pull requests a week from the community which is pretty awesome um, also, just as kind of a note, our backlog is trending up a bit. We're getting about 75 PRs open uh, as of this writing right now, or this uh, this meeting here. And so, um, it's something that uh, you know um, we'll probably batten down in a little bit. But there's a whole bunch of awesome stuff in the works as well. So I'm really happy to have that kind of number going up. This is a new stat. Um, we actually uh, came up with this uh, last week. Um, to kind of measure like what are the module trends looking like um, and here I basically did a split between the total number of modules we have in Metasploit and the number that do remote code execution and so the other modules would be things like aux modules things that grab credentials data that kind of stuff um, uh, denial of service all that sort of thing and if you kind of notice something here the gulf between remote code execution and all other module types uh, continues to increase in fact, it's actually wider than this. The way that I got this stat was um, just by looking at number of files in the modules directory. And uh, if you were to look at like say payload modules, that kind of grows uh, kind of uh, uh, geometrically um, with, with uh, payload types. In fact, we actually just hit 500 payload modules on this last release, which is pretty awesome. Um, but also something we'll need to be mindful of as we sort of continue growing. Um, overall, we're starting to accelerate. <laughs> if you can see the little um, dip at the end there, the little um, tail at the end, it's actually starting to twist up even further. And so I'm, I'm hoping that's kind of a trend that will continue as we as we uh, move throughout the year. Um, Google Summer Code Status. Um, right now, we, we basically made our decision to come into Google, and uh, the, the general announcement to the world will be in two days on May 4th. So we're looking forward to that and getting the students um, started up. We have some pretty awesome projects up. Um, uh, lined up, but we'll, we'll talk about those on May 4th. Um, things that landed this this, um, this period, this, this period basically means the last two weeks. Um, that's how we do sprints within uh, Rapid7 and within uh, Metasploit. Um, we had a couple of unpatched O days land within Metasploit this this week. Um, and one was a Trend Micro um, thread, thread Discovery Appliance. Um, I'm sorry, not Threat, Threat Discovery, not a Thread Discovery. Um, so basically, uh, one of our um, kind of uh, regular Metasploit contributors, Stephen Seeley, also known as Mr. Me, um, did a lot of analysis on uh, Trend Micro um, uh, uh, Threat Discovery Appliance and found, I think, over 150 different bugs in the appliance. Um, he put out basically a huge um, uh, series of CVEs, um, and he sh basically shared with us a Metasploit module that, that executes at least a couple of them, because it really only takes one to get in. Um, so and uh, the interesting thing about this is it won't ever be patched because Trend Micro has, has discontinued this appliance. So um, nice thing there. Also, this weekend, um, uh, someone posted details of, um, of a new exploit in GhostScript that um, is basically the fundamental um, uh, PDF renderer for a lot of different projects, including Cups, including your Mac, including a lot of Linux distributions, a lot of printers as well. And basically, you can get remote code execution as you can get through a few of the filters. Um, this, this, this um, vulnerability actually has a logoed website as well, which also serves as a proof of concept for the exploit. Uh, so it's kind of neat. You can download the logo and exploit your device at the same time. Um, and of course, it's called GhostBot. Um, we also have a few other things that landed this week. Um, one was the Microsoft Office Word um, HCA module, which effectively allows you to run code within Microsoft Office without having macros enabled. Um, really awesome thing. Microsoft patched it about 90 days ago, but it's still going to be out there in a while for a long time. Um, also, there's a nice Mercurial SSH sandbox breakout because Mercurial lets you use SSH as a transport, but this lets you break out of the sandbox and get a, a remote shell on the SSH on the Mercurial server. Um, a lot of new uh, documentation and Linux exploits and for Metasploitable 3 were landed this week too. Um, simply check out our presentation this uh, this week at Austin D Sides where we'll be talking about a lot of new Linux exploits that went into Metasploitable 3 and how they worked. Also, um, this news has been <laughs> really long in coming, but it finally happened. Um, Posits Interpreter is dead. Well, not really. We basically replaced it with what we used to call Metal. Um, at least within Metasploit Framework, is actually called Interpreter now. So whenever you 
we talked about interpreter within framework, you'll be getting the new implementation, which is half the size of the old one, yet it still supports many more features than the old one, including reverse HTTP and HTTPS support. support. I'm looking for this one to last us a long time, and I'm looking forward to adding a whole lot more features down the road. Um, that's actually where our 500 um, payload came. <coughs> We've also got another couple of unpatched O days in the works in the pull request queue right now. Um, the logarithm um, actually is currently vulnerable to a re remote root RCE in their appliance, um, which uh, we are looking at right now. Um, also, um, IS uh, 6.0 on Windows 2003, um, there was a forever day that was um, pushed out as a module. Um, this was part of um, some, some recent leaks as well. Um, or at least uh, that's sort of the theory that goes behind it. But uh, we, we did a lot of analysis of the shell code that was included in the module. And I think we have a good understanding of how it actually works, um, you know, the, the module and its like, technique itself. So we should be able to land that soon as well. A um, few other things. We got a lot of new RCEs um, in the works as well. Um, open SSH denial of service module. I've kind of waited for that was going to happen a couple of years ago. There's a way to uh, basically bog down an open SSH server by uh, sending a lot of um, uh, hashing requests to it. Um, so uh, that's actually um, available now as, as a module that will soon land. Um, also a lot of really cool pa um, payload extensions this 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 week as well. Um, Python Stager can now um, retry. It used to just fail on the first try and, and would give up, but if you have like network connectivity issues or something like that, Python Stager can actually keep going and it works just like the other stagers. Um, also, this is really awesome. Um, Railgun is basically a way to call arbitrary system calls or library calls from a interpreter payload. Um, traditionally, this is only supported in Windows, um, but due to some great work by D Zero Steiner, he's actually made it multi-platform and has added support to it in, in Python interpreter. So basically, you'll be able to run Railgun and be able to run arbitrary libraries and APIs from um, a Linux uh, platform as well, uh, which uh, he's even got a, a sample module for it that steals your credentials from, um, uh, you know, I think you know toolchain or keychain, yeah. So I'd be able to get credentials from from a, a arbitrary Linux app. Pretty cool stuff. Um, we're also working on a official Python API for external modules. Um, our first proof, proof of concept basically had all the um, you know the, the guts sort of laid out right in the module itself for talking over um, JSON RPC. Um, we're working on basically a library you can just pull in instead, and that will make it easier for people to. Uh, and basically, this, this is our next step to. Um, kind of formalizing how we'll interact with external modules, which will be really cool. Um, also, uh, some, some neat work was done on allowing Metasploit to run as a non-root user, yet still be able to packet capture and bind to low ports using Linux capabilities. Um, this is pretty important because a lot of times you don't necessarily want to run Metasploit as root. Of course, if you're a colleague Linux user, you probably do anyway. But um, a lot of folks still like kind of prefer to keep Metasploit as low privilege as possible. This basically lets you do the two things that you normally want to do with Metasploit, which is capture packets and, and bind to low ports like port 80 or port 443 without having to have raised uh, privileges. So it's some pretty awesome work there. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the teams that work on Metasploit within Rapid7 and what they've been working on. Um, the A team is, is one of the teams that you probably see, see the most on, on the channels. Um, Will Vu and, and Wei Chen are on there um, and some others. Um, so uh, definitely check them out. Um, some things that they worked on this, this sprint were uh, some updates to the authentication API and um, our ability to interact with WordPress. You can see some PRs in the works right there. Um, the omnibus packaging also gets handled by this team typically. So um, they bumped uh, Ruby to 241 and got some new fresh packages pushed out there. Uh, Metasploitable 3, of course, is also being handled by this team. Um, so a ton of new work done there this last sprint. Um, and of course, uh, you go on RC and, and you'll see most of the A team sort of idling there and, and handling, helping people out. Um, and uh, also this, this, this coming sprint, we're working on um, a, a Linux universal privilege escalation infrastructure. Kind of a long running issue that we've had with um, Linux, Linux privilege escalation modules is a lot of them actually compile C code on the target. Um, this is sort of fragile and not very portable, especially if you have targets that don't have a C compiler. Um, so uh, what we're looking at is basically leveraging some of the build infrastructure from metal payloads to be able to build universal binaries that can just be injected into the remote host. So uh, look for that coming up soon. We also have another team that works on um, Metasploit and um, uh, framework and pro related tasks. And um, one thing that the Xanathos team worked on this, this sprint was, um, was a lot of pro improvements to how vulnerability validation works. So effectively, um, in, in an upcoming release, you'll be able to do things like push uh, um, vulnerabilities to Nexpos straight from task change, which you couldn't do before. So then you can be able to set up customized workflows and even automatically run these kind of validations. There's also a lot of really improved uh, ability 
to find the modules that are affected by hosts, find the hosts that are affected by modules, all sorts of things that are just common common workflows um, that will be a lot simpler in, in, the, in the upcoming releases. Uh, there's also been a lot of import, uh, importer improvements, and namely Acunetics actually works a lot better now. Um, it can actually understand web vulnerabilities um, and, uh, and services and a lot of the new um, extra metadata that Acunetics provides. Um, the Xantos team is also doing some research into Eternal Blue exploitation and um, has been adding the support for the packets needed to exploit um, that within Ruby SMB. So look forward to that. And um, also, the Xantos team has been doing a lot of um, analysis of some of our pen testers' uh, sort of behaviors and, um, and and finding ways that we can improve Metasploit to be able to scale to common tasks that uh, a pen tester would need um, uh, for, for larger environments. Um, and I think that takes us to the end. And um, see if you can tell who this guy is. No. Anyway, he, he's, 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 a, he's a Dutch football coach, and his last name is Demos. So, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I was wondering if I could uh, see who's got their hand up for the demos this time. I'll go ahead and pass the mic over. Dev is going to be showing off some of the improvements he's made over the last sprint to uh, Metasploit Pro. And, um, and some of the interactions between um, pushing vulnerabilities to Nexpos uh, slash Insight VM and uh, the ability to uh, easily find modules that are relevant um, uh, when you pull them in. Right, right. So uh, can everyone see my screen? Yeah, it looks great, Jeff. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, when you're doing vuln validation, you, uh, if you go to the vulnerabilities uh, tab, uh, it has this wonderful option to, or capability to uh, select all the vulns and push them to Nexpos. Uh, so we added a task to do that um, where there's really no configuration because all of the vulnerabilities or all, all of the uh, exceptions and validations that were generated, you already know uh, where they originated from and stuff. So it just pushes them back to their respective um, consoles at the time of this task change step. Um, so there, there's not really too much uh, UI to show here, but uh, we we are gonna change the name uh, export here to export, uh, Expo's export. Um, I just, I haven't gotten to that yet. Awesome. Yeah. So that does that mean basically you can now schedule pushing things to Expos automatically? Yes. Yes. Exactly. And uh, so the last time I kind of had the applicable modules, like some of the columns were not uh, completely uh, filled out and stuff, but uh, it's it's all good and ready to go now. Um, you, you can um, see all the modules that have vulnerable hosts that can be run against. So it shows you what is relevant. Um, and the last thing that I added was in, in the hosts, uh, in a single host, the related modules uh, tab was an entire page. Uh, now it's a table like the rest of the tabs, so you can sort on it and stuff like that. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, previously you could only see maybe two exploits at a or two modules at a time from this view, and now it looks like you can see at least a dozen um, all at once here. Right, right. And yep, yep. That's that's that is uh, basically it. And can you go back to previous? The previous uh, table. Yeah. So if you had more than one host, sure. then it's susceptible to each of these modules. Uh, right. Is the I guess pop up going to be bigger? Wait, so we addressed that yesterday. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So if there's three, if there's more than three hosts, it'll uh, ellipses and uh, to actually see the hosts like if you want to see a full list you can um like one way is you you know you could like click on the module and it you know fills out the host but each of these vulnerabilities 
has um, if you like go to one like one of these volumes, you can get to the related hosts from there. Like if you if you like if you had a hundred of them, um, you know, or something like that. Uh, okay, awesome. Right, Sam, I believe you're referring to the references page. Um, you can see here just to the right where it says dot dot you know, seven total. Um, it's the same kind of same kind of idea. Understood. Right. It doesn't pop up. Uh, we're not going to include the pop up here just because um, in cases of uh, like uh, environment, say you have a thousand hosts that are vulnerable. Um, you probably won't have a thousand references, but of course, to scale to a thousand hosts, um, that would be kind of hard to show. It's going to pop up. And probably have unintended consequences. Um, so, so that that I don't believe that's going to actually work as a pop up. Does it require Dex to see that what you pulled in was imported from Expos, or does that check itself? It is. It no. is. Right. It is just for bones. Uh, so you know you you've done a Nexpos import and um, I it found uh, and you you know you did exploitation and you found uh, some validations, some exceptions. It will take everything in the workplace, all the exceptions, validations in your workspace, and uh, push them. Yeah, so the, your workflow here would be create a new, a fresh workspace, um, and then you would import all the hosts. You do whatever whatever task you want to do in the middle, where it's a, it's a resource script or something else, and then it should push all the basically all the findings. I think this would to, to word it that way. It's an expose that were, were relevant. Right. Cool. I some tests. I want to push them it it won't push anything in expose at that point because I believe it uses the same reference. From where, from where, from whence it imported, it shall export. Um, so if there was no import, it's not pushing anything in there. Right, right. Uh, this is actually using the same underlying logic that bone validation already uses today. Um, so. So it it's just like it's just like selecting all here and doing push to next phase, but at the time of execution. <laughs> 